what is that something special that seems to draw most of the long-term investors with very strong track records to Wells Fargo stock? That's the conversation topic I have on my mind today as we begin the third edition of the Conservative Income Investor Podcast. My name is Tim McAleenan. When I first started uh, studying stocks, one of the first things I learned is that banks tend to blow up every generation or so. If you look at the early 90s, early 70s, 1930s in particular, maybe even the 19, late 1960s a little bit, the, uh, the bank stocks just tend to get completely hammered because they engage in some kind of risky lending and then get undercapitalized and then a whole lot of shareholder equity gets wiped out. And so for that reason, I, uh, I guess when I first started studying, I, I developed an almost instinctive, reflective rejection of bank stocks as a category because it just seemed like, why would you want to buy something, keep reinvesting dividends, escalating your commitment to it over time, and then take a, take a regular chance that it'll just blow up on you. And that just didn't seem to me like intelligent behavior. But then I noticed that there were a couple banks, U.S. Bank Corp, M&T Bank, and then uh, Wells Fargo, that seemed to, there seemed to be something different about them. You had, at least with Wells Fargo, you had, not only did Warren Buffett make that his signature investment at Berkshire, but he invested in Wells Fargo in his personal accounts dating back to the 1970s. Charlie Munger, when he ran client portfolios or invested on behalf of hospitals, said that the first thing he does is add some Coca-Cola stock and Wells Fargo stock to the portfolio. Uh, Donald Jockman, when he ran the Jockman funds, he had a huge helping of Wells Fargo stock. Seth Klarman, when he ran the, uh, well, he still runs the Bow Post Group fund, he's held uh, giant Wells Fargo positions at different times throughout uh, his tenure there. I think it's a smaller position now, but he's held a lot of it. And I think even uh, the Fidelity Contra Fund, which has outperformed the S&P 500 since, I think, 1989 by like two percentage points, uh, they have a giant uh, Wells Fargo position. And so the question I wanted to answer is, what makes Wells Fargo so superior. First of all, uh, let's let's start by noting the data points. I have a uh, a stock calculator out here, and it's amazing to me how even with the crunch during the financial crisis, you still have extreme results for buy for people who have held Wells Fargo for the long term. So if you invested ten thousand dollars into it in 1972, you would have compounded at thirteen and a half percent. And that ten thousand dollars would now be two point six million. Um, let's enter another day. The point. Let's see. Nineteen seventy-eight. If you bought ten thousand dollars worth of Wells Fargo stock, then it would have compounded at fourteen point six percent per year, and you would have one point eight million dollars today. Uh, let's check on nineteen eighty-two. Since that time, Wells Fargo has compounded almost 17% a year, such that a $10,000 investment would be worth $2 million today. Uh, let's try 1988. Uh, Wells Fargo's compounded at 15.3% over that time frame, such that a $10,000 investment would be worth uh, 548000 Now let's check something from the 1990s. If you bought it in uh, 1994, your $10,000 investment would have compounded at 12.1%, and you'd have $124,000 today. Now, if you'll look at that chart I prepared, you'll see, even if someone held it for like the either the, the short end of the long term or the, the long end of the medium term, you can see that Wells Fargo traded at $17 per share in 2000, and at the time it was making $1.17, uh, per share in profits, and it was uh, paying out 45 cents a share in dividends. And yet, even though 
the company got rocked by the second greatest financial crisis since uh, the Great Depression, uh, or in, second to the Great Depression, you can see that over the 16-year time period, profits almost quadrupled and the dividend tripled. Just 16 years later, it's now earning 4.20 a share and paying out a dollar 52 in dividends. And if you bought it 16 years ago, your compounding rate without dividends invested, but including the dividends that got paid out, you would have 8.4%. If you did reinvest the dividends, you'd have a little over 9%. And that just seems like a, a crazy high total return figure for a company that in 2009, they saw their profits fall. Let's see here. Their profits fell from $8 billion in two, on the eve of the financial crisis down to $2.6 billion. And uh, they were paying $1.30 per share in 2008 in dividends. And then they had to cut it to $0.20, cents, so a nickel uh, share quarterly to, uh, because their profit engine went down by 75% during the uh, financial crisis. And so the question is, how... How did it recover? How did it get to this point where people who bought it only seven or eight years before this all happened have still earned very good returns despite the fact that everything hit the fan in 2008 and 2009? Well, there's a couple things. One, when you look at Wells Fargo, they are very good at cross-selling. And so not only does that have the effect of boosting profits, but it also increases stickiness in the sense that customers tend to be more loyal because you're, when you use a place as a one-stop shop, you're going to be more hesitant to leave that business. So you can see on the chart that Wells Fargo, I think it, it varies, but it's like 6.3 or 6.5. It varies a little bit quarter to quarter, but it's over 6 uh, products that Wells Fargo, that the average customer has with Wells Fargo. Now, that's, I mean, they, they do count everything there. So if you have a checking account and a savings account, that counts as two. If, uh, if you open up a vacation fund or a vacation savings account, that's three. You get a mortgage, it's four. You handle a brokerage that's five and then if you have something for your if you have kids and you open it with them it's six or seven and so you, you can see that the, the the numbers are anything they can count they will count but at the same point in time they count it the same way all the other banks and the industry average is more near two and a half so there there are additional products that people have with wells fargo compared to to other banks and you see that in the average number of years that someone stays with Wells Fargo, they tend to spend uh, 14 years on average as a Wells Fargo uh, client customer compared to eight, which is the industry average. And why this is important is it means that Wells Fargo has a very cheap deposit base because they, they don't have to worry as much about capital fleeing. If you look, let's say, We'll use Bank of America as an example. Bank of America has to deal with clients who, let's say General Electric has like a oil and gas relation uh, account with them, and they put $25 million with Bank of America. Well, they might, that could be very temporary. They might, it might sit there for six months, the money gets taken out, and then the account closed. So it's more of a, uh, a passing through transaction. And what that means is it's more difficult for Bank of America to make money on, to, to make a loan on those funds because they're not there as long. So part of the magic of Wells Fargo is that they have a very cheap capital base because each customer has all these different products with them and they will uh, they will keep their money there over very long periods of time so that they have the kinds of customers who they might put $10,000 in an account and that's their emergency fund and then they might add $500 to it next month and $500 to it the month after that to build it up and so that enables okay Wells Fargo can loan out $130,000, $140,000 
on the mortgage for someone's property because that money tends to stay there a little bit more than you see with the competitors. And in an individual instance, it may not seem like a big deal, but across a trillion dollar deposit base, it's something that, that starts to really add up. So not only do they get profits higher by having people open more and more accounts with them, but by virtue of having those additional accounts, it then translates into more loyalty because you're, you're going to be very hesitant. If you reach a point where your brokerage, your mortgage, your savings, your checking, and your kids' accounts are all through Wells Fargo, it would take a colossal controversy, screw up, or like just tremendous dissatisfaction for you to leave that. And so, especially after that Wachovia acquisition during the financial crisis, Wachovia in the early 2000s, they had the absolute best uh, customer service in the industry. And so, not only did Wells Fargo shareholders buy a tremendous asset on the cheap, Sorry, if any of you listening to this are a former Wachovia shareholder, you got completely hosed because your bank's management did not have enough liquidity in 2008 to ride out the storm. The book value at Wachovia was almost $40 a share, and I think the the final transaction when Wells Fargo bought Wachovia, it was in the single digits. It was a complete steal, and if you lost money on on uh, Wachovia, my heart goes out to you because you, you owned a tremendous asset and because it was mismanaged, you lost a, a whole lot of money. And so, anyway, I digress. If you look at, uh, back to Wells Fargo, if you see how their profits completely exploded once the Wachovia acquisition got taken in, those $8 billion profits they were making in 2006 and 2007, by 2013, they turned into $21 billion profits. I think that's what, when Warren Buffett was just piling all those billions and billions and billions of dollars, I think that's what he saw. He liked Wells Fargo to begin with, and then he saw Wachovia get acquired, and he thought, holy cow, this thing is just going to explode in earnings once things normalize a bit. Once it gets fully capitalized, suddenly you're going to have that stock that had $40 per share in book value. It's going to augment its six seven billion dollar profit engine to combine with wells fargo and so you have you would have a 15 billion dollar juggernaut and then just natural growth and recovery got you from 15 billion to the the 20 billion dollar range and in terms of the business model you have the legacy of wachovia's exceptional customer service intermingling with Wells Fargo's cross-selling, which is probably one of the best examples in recent history of a synergy where you have people cross-selling and then you also are combining it with people who are very good at creating customer loyalty and that just combines to give you a low-cost capital base because the money remains there for long periods of time and then uh, Wells Fargo can use it to make loans. And for an example of a terrible synergy during the financial crisis, you should look at what Bank of America did acquiring Countrywide, which I think there was a Duke professor who said that was the worst acquisition ever in American corporate history, which I would say it's, it's either that or uh, the AOL Time Warner. Anyway, back to Wells Fargo. If you would look at the uh, the chart again, you'll see that the loan growth of the portfolio has historically averaged 8.5%. I do think those days are probably not long gone, but just because Wells Fargo now is a trillion dollar bank in terms of its total assets, you're not going to see 8.5% growth. I would plan on 6 or 7% growth, and that means I would say... Six or seven percent loan growth can translate into seven to ten, maybe eight to ten percent earnings per share growth. And then when you add that to the dividend, you can sort of see why the stock has become the largest position in the in the Berkshire Hathaway portfolio. Also, the default rate on Wells Fargo loans is incredibly low. It's it's zero point three four percent right now. And it's it has the capital on hand to to handle a default rate of 3.3 percent, meaning if 
something happened where the default rate was more than 3.3%, then of those $21 billion in profits that Wells Fargo is earning, it would then have to reach into that profit base to, um, to, to add capital to cover the default rate. And that, 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 that uh, profit rate, if, if defaults rose, of course, your profit engine would, would decline a bit. But Wells Fargo is usually well equipped to handle uh, extreme swings in uh, the business cycle because even during the worst of uh, the financial crisis, they never had a quarter where uh, the default rate exceeded 6%. And heading into it, uh, they, they, they weren't even prepared for 2% default rates. So one of the weird things about banks is that uh, a lot of the, the, the prejudice that people have towards what happened in 2008, 2009, all of the, the Dodd-Frank regulations have sort of strangled them in terms of uh, the, the onerous capital requirements so that it could never, uh, so that it couldn't happen again. So the the new look of banks is that the default rate has been greatly minimized, but also you have larger pools of stagnant capital that, that can't be converted into loans, and so the growth rate probably won't be there as much, although Wells Fargo still has a high single-digit loan growth. Uh, they loan a lot of money in uh, the uh, California business and uh, real estate markets, although they, they did buy A.G. Edwards, and so they're moving into the, the Midwest as well, and then with Wachovia, it's more of they also have that, that North Carolina area too, but it's still, I think, over half their uh, earnings originate on the West Coast, so it's still a, a West Coast bank, even if it's not quite as West Coast reliant as it was a few years ago. Anyway, thank you for listening to the podcast. I hope that this uh, helped explain and t- work you through why Wells Fargo seems to have that like blessed halo effect from from many of the most famous uh, value investors and why its returns have been so extremely high despite the fact that the industry it operates in has been wrecked with crises in the past two generations. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Have a good day. Tip.